The program tonight uh, is part of an Ohio Humanities Grant that the museum got, which includes an oral history of the creative process and of the Phelps Brothers works. And that will air most likely uh, on the Ohio History Connection, as well as our YouTube channel, and more than likely will get over to the PBS station, uh, Western Reserve PBS, at some point in the near future, uh, once it's completed. So I want to thank Ohio Humanities for the grant that's allowed us to do that and to bring this work to life. And with that, I will introduce to you Kyle and Kelly Phelps. And our moderator tonight is June Sachs. She is an affiliate scholar at Canyon College uh, with specialties in, I can't always remember, so I have to look, um, the public, sec public sector folklore and American folk and rural culture. You have been on the funding panels for Ohio Humanities Council and the Ohio Arts Council. So Judy's your moderator. You're here to connect in conversation with the artists. Please enjoy your evening. Thank you, Max. Uh, I want to welcome you all and just give you a, a brief layout of what we're going to be doing in the next hour or so. Um, I will be conducting a conversation with Kelly and Kyle, um, and we'll get to issues about biography, about art, and about the context of the art. And our thought is that at the end of our conversation, we will invite you to join in with your own questions. So uh, enjoy yourselves, and don't forget, if you haven't taken a good look at the exhibit, please spend the time to do so. Uh, welcome to Kelly, welcome to Kyle. Um, I'm going to start by saying uh, something that surprises me, which is that here we are in an art museum context, a place devoted to the arts and to teaching art, and yet you have said that you think of yourselves as journalists. I'd like you to expand upon that and tell us what are the stories you're telling in Blue Collar and why you tell them. First on Kelly Holmes. Um, we're going to kind of try to take turns. We're kind of, uh, wow. we are twins, we are brothers, but we are uh, rivals when it comes to talking. So <laughs> we'll try to take your time with this. I think that the, the whole fact that we are visual artists and we are very much interested in capturing kind of the essence of the narratives that we're trying to create, I think it's important for us to actually understand the real, the sense of authenticity that we're trying to create and trying to find in our work. So our connection to what we talk about as being journalists is the fact that we want to try to capture the sense of history sense of time, that sense of place. So as a visual artist, I don't really see myself any different than a journalist, except for everything. So I think that's our real connection. For the most part, I think that our starting point for creating our work is getting out the top of the Do you guys know? Well, how do you build authenticity into this work? I think we first should describe how we started out. Kyle and I started out in graduate school and we were very much interested with the figure and we were getting to the point that we were pretty good about constructing the figure, but we didn't really understand the full context of trying to create, create that sense of history and that sense of time and place. And we learned a really valuable lesson we had an exhibition in Louisville, and we had an interview with a, a critic who wrote about our work and described our work as you know, eloquent, you know, it was fine detail, and you know, it was beautiful work, and the work really looked like Hummel figurines. <laughs> <laughs> so as two giant African-American artists creating the smallest, daintiest kind of smallest work, it was the, the death knell in the coffin for us, and it taught us a valuable lesson that we needed a sense of time, place, and history. So we wanted to still remain true to our ceramic background and our artistic background, but we needed that sense of authenticity, and that authenticity came from the juxtaposition of found objects. So that's where we started to create um, sculptures that had a direct reference to the found objects that we were looking at. I think all before we were creating these random figures with no context. So they would just be random standing figures that has, 
felt very contrived and very, very boring and, and didn't really speak to anything. So it was something that um, it was always there before us, you know, looking at different materials and you know, working that back into our work. And it really connected our figures to, to what we were talking about. We'll go back more specifically into the artworks. Um, maybe as people are glancing at the screen, you can at least say what it is we're looking at. Sure. So looking at the work right now, this is kind of will give some understanding of how we start out. Kyle and I start out with a, with any piece, we'll start out with a lot of a community type of collaboration. So if we're starting out with a factory motif, we would actually go to a factory site, take some documentation, get a sense of history, um, the visuals, we'll, we'll find out the history of the plant um, and its connection to the community. And once we do that, then we we'll actually start out our, our interviews. So we interview everyone from the truck delivery person that would deliver slack material to the plant, um, factory workers, security guards, anyone that was connected to the plant would actually go in and get a sort of oral presentation or, or history from that particular person. Then we would actually start to collect and archive actual found objects from the plants. Kyle and I strictly are interested in plants that are slated for demolition or plants that have already been leveled or raised. Um, so standing plants and plants that are full blown production and still moving, we're really not interested in that. We're really, really interested in the plants that are, are being torn down. So that starts our initial kind of um, our process. Once we start that, then we actually start the actual fabrication of the forms. And that's, that's kind of our process. Well, we're going to go um, take a look at, at the art in detail, but maybe we need to also bring in how you came to do this work. Was there something in your background that pointed you toward looking at factory workers? I think our beginnings early on, um, growing up in Newcastle, Indiana, was a very much a company town, kind of like um, Kenton is. So a company town where the, the lead factory was Chrysler, and Chrysler was the largest plant, and of that plant we had maybe 20 other supporting plants around. But at the time, Kyle and I had no knowledge or no clue that we wanted to be visual artists at that time. We graduated from Newcastle Chrysler High School in the mid-1990s and then went on to, to college where we had a formal training. But once again, we had no sense of clue or an ideal or position of where we're going to go with our art until we graduated and had our degree and couldn't get a job on our degree. So we ended up back in the plant. It was at that point in time where we really started to understand, well, wow, we have a college degree and we're coming from a factory background in a community where, you know, there are lots of people like us, but we weren't really represented in the art world. And that's what really kind of started our, our investigation of who we are and what we need to do. Because all before, even in college, Kyle and I were doing what was expected of us we're African American, so in our head we had, you know, our expectations that we're supposed to present Afrocentric art because this is who we are. So for many years during our college experiences that we started to just create angry black man <laughs> art. So we were black, we have to make angry black man art and make art about the slavery periods or civil rights periods. And I have great respect for all of that, but it really wasn't our lived experience. And that's what really inspired our work. Like sometimes those ideals are right in front of you, and you just forget about it, because you think you, know, you have to make work about what's expected of you. That's the long story. And just to add to that, what Kelly was talking about, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes, sometimes you put blinders on, and you don't recognize you know, the gifts that are presented right there in front of you. And the gift, in our case, was you know, developing who we are as artists and the materials that we use and, and you know, some of the topics that we, that we kind of create a work based off of. 
And for us, it was definitely that connection with um, um, the blue collar experience. You know, our mom and dad, family members, neighbors, we, we come from a really rich working class background. And, and it was just like a light just turned on. And we've been doing this ever since. I was very struck in previous conversations we've had about um, what you said about your father when he came home from work and how you would go to him and his shoes. So if you would share that. So this is kind of concerning and funny, but uh, our father would go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning and come back around 4.30, 5 o'clock. So he would disappear for that chunk of time. By the time he got home, you know, he was tired, and, but he went through this ritual process of sitting on the step and taking his work boots off. And then Kyle and I would actually go and fight over who could pick the metal shavings out of his boots, out of the soles of his boots. So it was looking at that, you know, that sense of ritual that he had that became really interesting for Kyle and I to think, wow, this is, um, this is something he did on a daily basis every day. You know, because my mom wouldn't allow him to come into the house and, you know, walk all over the house with his work boots on because of the metal shavings would tear up the linoleum floor and everything else. But it was that whole act of him doing this over and over and over again every day. So it became, it became something, it became something that was this mundane experience, but that's what she really inspired Kyle and I to actually take those everyday mundane experiences and translate that into our depictions, our narratives. It also seems to me that when you talk about the mundane and the repetitive, you find a certain kind of heroism in that. It's, it's not just heroism, it's, it's profound respect. Um, now that I'm, I'm more, much older now, to see someone have to do something and do it in that kind of um, unselfish way to provide for your family, I, I do find that. I, I find him as a working class hero more so than I would find you know, a, a celebrity or a Michael Jordan or a Tiger Woods or whoever you know, we think our, our heroes are. But it took us many years to develop that. You know, our father was just like any other dad or any other Joe on our block. I mean, he went to work and came home and provided for his families. It, it's those types of people that I have, you know, more respect for now. But, you know, it, it took so long time to get to that point. It's a, something that Kelly and I never really thought about. I mean, our father would go to work, we'd go to this mysterious place and do his deed and come home. We really didn't really have a true understanding of that. And so we took part in actually working in the factory alongside our father. And just to see the things that the father and the men and women went through working in a primary plant, you know, it was just it's disheartening, it's, it's unbelievable, it's, you know, it's, it's depressing. Depressing a little bit, yeah. You know, and it just gave us you know, all of these different types of ideas to put back into our work. And to put this in perspective, my father worked at a fire store, and he worked in the same cell, a 10 by 10 cell. I mean, that's what they call the workspace that you work in the factory that you perform your task for almost 20 years in the same spot. So never moving up, always in the same spot. And it was amazing when Kyle and I worked in the plant and had to actually go and visit this site and there, to notice right away that there were no windows that the drone and cycling of the machines was deafening to a point you really couldn't even sing a song in your head or it was, it was miserable. And for Kyle and I to go to that same plant to work beside him, it was awful. Every day, every day that we worked there, we wanted to quit, except for payday. And then it was just terrible. What a college degree at that. So it really kind of made us look at our father in a whole different light how he provided for us and sacrificed for us for that many years doing this repetitive thing. So, pretty amazing. So, the figures that you had as factory workers in your art, do you also look at them as people who uh, undergo a lot of sacrifice and embed good values because of that? I 
think good values, obviously sacrifice, but work ethic. I mean, how and I, or where we're at, because of that strong sense of work ethic that my father instilled in us, but also what the factory instilled in him. So it was, it, it's, it's funny now that I'm, we're, we're older now and I look back at it and I thought this was cruel and unusual punishment for my father to drag us into the plant. But I think that it taught us a valuable lesson that you, know, that, you, know, you have to, sometimes you have to sacrifice, sometimes you have to give up. And for him to give up so much for so long in that isolated, dark, dismal plant, it's pretty amazing. And that's why I do consider anyone who, who does this, whether you work at the Speedway gas station or you're mopping floors in the hospital, I mean, that is, if you're doing it for the right reasons, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty remarkable. You know, and you never see art about those commoners or common people in a park or anywhere. I mean, it just, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And that's why Kyle and I really are, are interested in this whole notion of working class heroes and the common person who disappears and you know, will perform a task and you know, they're underrepresented in, in the world. And working class folks, we're the makers of everything, but we're the least represented in, in visual arts. Outside of the realm of Diego Rivera, you, know, you don't really see a whole lot of art just about the common man. So if you go through the gallery, not the gallery, but if you go through the museum and you see the work, you won't see heroic poses. You know, it, it's none of that. We're not, we're not believers in that, that realm. So it's, it's something that if you can make a connection or, or if this reminds me of your aunt or your uncle or your brother or neighbor, or if you have a personal connection with that, you know, that's where we find success. Uh, and, and it's something that is ongoing for us. Well, it seems like your work tries very hard to tell truth. And when people look at WPA era art or Diego Rivera's murals, sometimes it seems that things are idealized. I, I think, I mean, we have profound respect for, for WPA artists, and especially Diego Rivera's work. But if you look closely at the work, the time period, it, it, it seems really interesting, the fact that if you look at Diego Rivera's Detroit mural industry paintings, you will start to see some things that really weren't of that time. Like, the, the amount of segregation that was happening in Detroit was pretty, pretty evident. I mean, blacks and whites often didn't even work within the same cell. But in those paintings, it's very idealized. Even to this day, factories can be very segregated and can be very um, sexist and everything else. So what we're trying to do is talk about not only that our work is in, you know, not focusing on really kind of heroic poses, but our work is about the island idleness that is occurring right now in the, in the plant. So um, there's a lot of downtime. There's um, there's strikes left and right. There's, there's there's factories that are closing down. That's what Kyle and I tend to focus on right now. So one of the moods you see in the work is idleness. Yes. Right? So it's, we have it's workers in just kind of in wait for their cause. You don't have we don't actually show that the workers actually in motion and doing things. And I think that's the very point that we want to make. Is that you know, there are a lot of people that want to work, but the opportunity is not there or it's being kind of yanked, you know, beneath the feet. And it's just something that when we left the factory, it has gone down to the point that we're going from 20,000, 30,000 people employed to just a handful to nothing. And that's when the bulldozer comes and scrapes down and tears down the factories and it's all over. It's just, it's disheartening and it's, it's sad because it's everywhere. It's not just our hometown. It's, 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 it's like a disease that's spreading. Well, maybe in that vein, you could say something about what you did for your sabbatical. So it's interesting that Kyle and I had a chance to do our sabbatical together. Um, we had a chance to venture the Rust Belt um, everywhere from, I think our first venture was Detroit, and we went to Flint, Michigan, uh, Gary, Youngstown. We spent a lot, of time, a lot of time in Flint and Youngstown. But not only to all those big major primary plants, and Chrysler's and GM's and Ford's, but every other little small plant that supported that industry. But it was funny that when Kyle and I would actually go and visit these sites and retrieve material to 
know, to be nearly arrested seven times in one month for going on factory private sites and you know, collecting materials, because obviously they think that we're scrappers and we're collecting aluminum or metal. But, but when we tell them what we're doing, then they're really interested in the fact that we're trying to kind of archive the sense of you know, history and, and to tell our story. Um, it'd be, it's, it's, it's painful sometimes to go to these sites to see that a factory that had been in place for 80, 90 years and then next month it's being slated to be scraped off the face of the earth as if it never existed. And that's what really kind of motivates Kyle and I to go and really kind of archive this sense of time, place, and history. Um, because it is history. It's not African American history, it's American history. It's, it's, it's history. And that's why I make that connection to the inner journalist in a way, because you are kind of recording that sense of time, place, and history. Well, speaking of your own hometown, um, how do communities survive the decline of the Rust Belt? I can tell you a lot of communities that had a primary plant. What I mean by a primary plant would be a Chrysler or a GM type of plant aren't surviving. And they'll have other sub industries, I call them, such as Walmart, to move into that town. And the town never ever really recovers and it's that whole sense of American pride or American made, man-made materials and, and, and products just go to the wayside. There was a time when Kyle and I lived in Newcastle. Um, my father worked at, at the Chrysler plant for a while and, and everybody, everybody drove a Chrysler product. And if you drove a Honda, you could not park on that factory parking lot. It was that and grain. That and grain. In fact, it was the, so ingrained that the factory um, named the high school. It was Newcastle Chrysler High School until the factory closed down. And then we dropped Chrysler off of the high school name. So it's weird because you know we're hoping that this whole sense of American made products or American made anything will come back. Because I mean, that really it built the communities. It built the communities that were around. So. You just gave a sense of pride you know, that you actually belong to something bigger. And once a factory is you know, a town, you know, it could be the, the lifeblood of that town or city. Once it leaves, then you know, things just start to fall to the wayside. Alcoholism goes up, crime goes up, you know, and, and people just move away. And it just becomes a shell of what used to be. So it's a very important for us to keep this going. And, it's really important for us to keep this going, and, and you know, I, I feel like that we're not exhausted um, with all the possibilities of creating work you know, because we're always inspired you know, going to another town. It, it sounds really weird, but you know, it's, it's something that we've not actually burned our way through and, and, and exhausted and move on. And now I'm going to do, you know, paintings about a cow in the pasture or something. You know, that's not who we are. It's funny because our father was always interested in our work, but he was, I think either he was too close to what we were doing, because he would always call us up and, you know, he passed away in March, but he would always call us and say, hey, uh, I've got this newspaper clipping of Tiger Woods swinging this golf club. Why don't you make that? <laughs> yeah, Dad, we're, we're going to get right on that. Or, you know, I saw this really neat Indian. Uh, you, should, you should do that. Like, what the hell does an Indian have to do with the work that we're talking about. So it's, it pained him to see work about him, but he was also motivated by, oh, what, what are you gonna do with that? How, how are you gonna make a living talking about you know, working poor, working class people, when you can make a sculpture of Michael Jordan you know, shooting a jump shot? Or... So it was, as a sculptor, I have to kind of, we have to be true to what we are what we're about. And I think we're still very much about you know, the whole working class struggles because you lived it, you experienced it, we, we know it, it's, it's who we are. What struck me in other conversations we've had is that when children tell their parents, guess what, I'm going to be an artist, normally they're like, what are you talking about? But that was not the case in your family. 
I think at the time with our family, it's that so many of us worked in the plant, and we knew that the writing was on the wall. And this is the mid-1990s where NAFTA came in and took out you know, entire plants, and they give you the decision, you know, if you are going to stay with us, you're going to have to relocate to Canada, or you're going to have to relocate to Mexico. I mean, what family is going to uproot their family and move to Mexico? Or reprogram. You know, they gave my dad a, an opportunity to, to reprogram or retrain at the age of what 55 with his yeah that was, that was 57 57 55 and now you have to you know learn computer programming to run a cnc milling machine that runs on the computer and we're talking about most people worked on the plane at that time had you know eighth and ninth grade education so you're talking about an older gentleman who has to now compete with the average high school kid technology-wise. So it was those types of things. It was very disheartening to see him, you know, and the fear in his eyes and many of their eyes that, that, you know, you have to either retool, retrain, or you're going to end up losing this, this, this career, this job. So for that reason, he was pleased that you chose a different path? He was pleased, but at the same time, very worried, like, because in our town, I mean, keep in mind, the town wasn't an art town. I mean, um, we didn't have art centers. Uh, high school programs had one, maybe two art classes. And the art classes were very, you know, put your hand on a piece of construction paper and trace around and make that curtain for that student. You guys know, so. So it was very, it was that. Because in our town, if you're going to live or exist in town, you're going to be a pipe fitter. You're going to be an electrician. You're going to know something about hydraulics. You're going to learn how to run a gear cutter. It was that type of town where everybody worked in the plant. Everybody's aunt and uncle worked in the plant, or you worked in the plant. I mean, that's, that's the town that we lived in. Let's go back to that effect in a community when the factory goes away. Uh, really, you're talking about a crisis of belief. Yes. And it seems to me that you've talked about you know, how people felt about the factory in almost a religious kind of way. Our folks weren't really religious, but they went to work religiously. And they believed that the factory, if you did really well, you could move your way up or your way up. Um, it's, we have to look at it like, like the factory was the church. And, you went to work to perfect the product. So like many people who go to church, you go to church to, to get whatever you're looking for out of that church. Well, the same thing applies to our work. And when Kyle and I were, were growing up, and we did go to church, we didn't really know what was going on in church. We didn't pay attention to the sermons. We were going to in that, and it pained us to be there. But we were interested very much in the amount of art that was inside the church, the stations of the cross, um, those sculptural elements, and then uh, the beauty of the stained glass windows. So all of that became very important, and we started to kind of, something triggered in our heads, to think, well, this is art. How do we talk about our experiences of our mother and father and how they went to work religiously, I mean, just religiously perfecting and you know, a good example is my dad made the same gear for 22 years in the same spot, the same item, item over and over again. That's, that, that was his religion. That was his thing. So the church, in a sense, was the factory. And the factory workers was pretty much the congregation. And that's how he looked at our town. And it was, it was the factory. Christ was bigger than the church. It was the church. It was the religion. So that helps us see some of the work that's in the gallery. Absolutely. Um, we like to look at our work as many altar pieces, very much like the Stations of the Cross. So, um, so we're paying homage to those gear cutters or to those steel workers or coal miners or people who worked in the mills. Um, that, that became something that became really important for us because, like I said, we weren't really religious, but 
we know and understand and respect the whole ideal of working religiously to perfect and provide for your family. And that's that's the reason why the work is on the wall. But even still, I think that work is actually, it's, it's growing, it's transcending. Outside of factories, we're talking about service industry, the people who make your food. If you go to a hotel, it's the people that you know, bring your first linens, it's, it's the janitors, the people that we take for granted. You know, those are very much our working class folks as well. So we're, we're still coming full circle, and, and you know, the breadth of our, our work and our creations are it's getting wider and wider and wider. Because this is, this, is, this is our lived experience. This is things that we remember. And, and we're talking about invisible people. I mean, those people who make the products, but then they disappear you know, into society. And, we're, we're a society of consumers, but we're so enamored by the end product. It's funny because we work at a, a plant with our father and we made transmissions for high-end specialty vehicles for like, you know, Mercedes, SUVs, and you know, hardly anybody in the plant can probably can even afford the very products that we're producing. So it's, it's those types of things that keep us really motivated into making those types, you know, those types of works. I do want to ask a little bit more about your Invisible People series, but I would like to return to the artworks here. Um, and can you say something about the flag and what it means in this work? The flag is, um, it's a little tricky. Um, some people will look at the flag and then not think twice about it. But Kyle and I like to really kind of inject that flag in all of our pieces so that it becomes this constant reminder of what once was. The whole sensibility of American-made products. I don't know if we were the tail end of that generation or what has happened that it doesn't even, it, it doesn't even make the front page of a newspaper when a factory, an American factory, shuts its doors and it doesn't even hit the front page. And why that doesn't you know, send alarm bells to everyone. But that whole sense of American pride, American-made objects, that whole sensibility of American pride, it's, it's, it became really important for us that we want this to come back. And there is this constant reminder of what once was good and what still is very much good. So you, you'll have that, whether it be a blatant American flag like that or uh, a sheet metal, um, corrugated sheet metal you know, motif to make it look like an American flag, but it's still very much still here, but it's, it's just not as bright and shiny as it So just used just through symbolism, through a lot of the workers' clothes, you'll have that, that color palette of red, white, and blue. You know, that's, that's going to make that, that tie back to the flag and our belief system and you know, the, the sense of pride. So it's, it's there. You just have to kind of, kind of look, look into the work to actually see it. I would be remiss if I did not bring up the elephant in the room. Uh, which is that you guys may be not only brothers, but twins. <laughs> and I know the museum was really interested in that aspect of you as creative people, how you create as, as a unit, and what the history of that is. Very dysfunctional. <laughs> we're, we're playing it nice right now for you guys, but it's, um, it's like very much like a marriage. I mean, it is, um, we are literally, one person that happens to be in two different bodies. So when Kyle and I work together, we are really one person and we do things for the greater good of the work. So there's no singular author, you know, authorship to any one of our works. It's not a Kyle piece, it's not a Kelly piece, it's a Kelly and Kyle piece. <clears throat> I think what we have is a subconscious okay to start projects individually, and then usually it comes back full circle. Kelly would do things to contaminate the work or I would do things to contaminate you know, the work that he's working on and it becomes our work. So a lot of people they have this, this really um, I fear, guess, fear yeah, about collaborating or having another person work on their, their, their painting, their sculpture, and it's something that we fully embrace. That doesn't come without um, a lot of arguing and yes. cussing and shaking of fists. And, yeah, that's part of our process. So that's how we communicate and how we get things done. There's a lot of um, venting of anger, if that way. But I think a lot of it also started out early on with, um, with 
the fact that we are twins and the fact that we had to share literally everything right down to our first twin size bed that we had to share. A twin size bed and twins. Keep in mind, one bed. we are the last of the four boys and four girls. So the belief in hand downs and sharing, that was very much ingrained into us. So going back to the whole collaboration, you know, this is something that we have done from, from day one. We don't know anything different but to share and to work together. And a lot of folks think that you know, being a twin, for us, it's, it's very alien, it's very weird and strange and, and crazy. We're 43 and we're still dressing alike and we have the same cars and you know, the same jobs and it goes on and on and on. But it's something that it's, we identify with that. We you know twins that would go all out of their way to you know, split up and go their own separate ways. I wouldn't even know, and I can't even imagine what that would be like. It's, it's, it's crazy to think that of us. Work-wise, it's, it, it's to our benefit, because Kyle and I will work on four or five pieces at one time. Some of that alludes back to our work ethic by um, working in the factory and working with plant and assembly lines. And so we'll actually work on four or five pieces and rotate those pieces between us so that there's always a constant sense of production so we never get bored, and we're always constantly moving. So to our benefit, you know, and, and twins, it's helped us out a great deal. So, so one, one person's not the painter, and the other person's a sculptor. Both of us have been born and trained. Um, both of us are quite you know, functional and interchangeable when it comes to our task. So he's not better than you know, painting, I'm better than sculpting or fabricating. We're both equal. And, and it's, it's, it's become a success for us to kind of capitalize on that. In terms of the technical doing of the work, um, you work in a fairly small space. And do you do it as stations where different activities happen? Absolutely. So what Kyle and I typically just start out first with, when we talked about it earlier in the presentation, is that we go through and conduct our interviews. From the interviews, we'll do our photo documentation. And then we'll finally get back into the studio. Once we hit the studio, we do all the clay production, all wet work, all at one time, because our studio is incredibly small. And that kind of, kind of really kind of unconscious, unconsciously leads back to the cell that my father worked in the plant. It's like a nine by 10 cell, and that's literally the size of our studio. It's a really tiny studio. So Kyle and I would work on all the clay production, get the clay work finished, and then off to the kiln. So the work goes to the kiln. While the work is in the kiln, we go and start working on the background facades. So once the facades are created, the work should be ready to come out of the kiln. Then we get into the painting and surfacing component of the work, and then it all comes together. It would be a chaotic mess for slinging clay and painting and welding all in the same little space. So it's I have about two more questions that we're going to go through, and then we'll open it up to you all. Uh, let's go back to that Invisible People series. Um, who, are the, who are the new categories of folks you're looking at and reflecting on their stories? Um, currently, we're looking at uh, janitorial, custodial staff. Um, we're really interested in, in farm and agricultural series. Seasonal workers. Seasonal yeah. workers. Outside of Newcastle, Indiana, there is Riddell. Yeah, works, trucks, um, canning factory, where they do tomatoes and fruits and, and concentrating on the seasonal workers that would come in and you know, perform their task and, and then they disappear after the season's over. You know, those are the folks that we're kind of venturing out and you know, tapping into as well. Yeah, um, this summer we're going to be focusing in on the coal industry and how important that is and how you know, integrated that is into our society. I mean, if these lights were on, I mean, what would happen? But these people, you know, we never hear stories, or it's rare that we do hear stories, or even see a depiction of a coal miner. You just don't see that that often, and you know, these people make the lights come on. So it's, it's that type of thing that we're really interested in expanding upon. Because all so often, you know, forever, we just talked about blue collar as a relationship to the steel industry or manufacturing, but blue collar is, it's much broader than that. You were saying that you have an upcoming exhibition in Houston. Yes. And they don't really relate to the factory nature of it. 
Is that right? So what's happening in Houston, we have a gallery representation in Houston, Texas, but, and they were really interested in our work, but they disassociated our work as being connected to you know, the blue collar steel and manufacturing, but automatically look at our work as being connected to the very refinery and the oil industry of Texas, obviously, because Texas oil is hand in hand. So, so we like the whole notion that our work becomes kind of universal, that if we take our work up north, it is about the auto industry, manufacturing, steel and steel industries. If we take it down south, you know, it's about the coal industry. If you take it even further down south, it's about textiles. So the work changes hands, and you know, and it taught Kyle and I to not kind of you know dedicate our work to one theme or one kind of genre within the blue collar because it's much broader. So our work and our images are not about any specific people, and they're not really any specific place. So the work can transcend and go in different directions. Uh, the last topic that I'll raise here before we turn it over is about you as scholars and professors. Uh, what are the philosophy and practices that you try to pass on to your students? I think for the most part is developing a good work ethic, you know, staying true to the craft, dedicating time, energy, interest into our work and into their work. I think that you, you you learn by actually experiencing and, and seeing how your instructor works. And then hopefully you can take that and, and use it to your benefit and develop your own work ethic. I think that um, for myself, as an educator now, it's funny to see our students, and as soon as I give them an assignment, then they rush off to Home Depot, or they have to go to the art store to buy art materials. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Sometimes those materials are right there in front of you. Um, if you're going to be true to whatever it is that you're doing, let's say that you're, you're interested in the environment. So for our students, they want to rush off to Home Depot and get a fresh plank of wood or a, you know, a fresh tube of or whatever. But they're talking about the environment. Why not go to the environment? You know, go to the source that's the most authentic. So I really try to ingrain our, into our students that, you know, sometimes what you're looking for is right in front of you. And you, you know, you repress that for such a long time, but sometimes you just have to really sit down and think about what you're doing and, you know, try to be true to what you're doing. You had also made a comment in another conversation about um, the effect of technology in contemporary culture and how you would like to see some other aspects of using handicraft. Um, this past year, we have um, created a tech space in our university just to compete with other universities. That tech space has now grown into about five different pieces of equipment. Most of them are 3D printers, wrapper prototype machines, and CNC milling machines. What I call it is the Antichrist machine because the, they literally can replicate this bottle, scan it, and reproduce that model. In today's kind of society, we're looking for that instant gratification. We click the mouse and then in, you know, out comes a product. In the art world, that can be good or bad. Um, as an educator, I want to make sure that our students have that sense of craft, that sense of eye-hand, brain coordination, so that they understand the importance of craftsmanship starts with your hands, your eyes, and your brain. Not necessarily Photoshop, or Maya, or whatever cool software that can you know, render your object. So it's kind of scary times because we've made technology happen so fast that we don't want to remove the artist's hand from the actual process. And I think that's, it could be a danger. But the, you know, they said the same thing with photography, that photography is going to kill painting. It didn't, it just changed painting. But we have to be careful that we don't implement technology first without understanding the importance of craft. Yeah, I think it could be done hand in hand. You know, having 3D printers <clears throat> or software that could you know, render anything, all those should be used as tools. It should never be there to replace you know, tradition. And I think it's something that we really want to instill in our students. Tradition is first. 
Everything else should be used as a secondary or to support tradition. So it's just something that we really want to instill and make sure that students don't jump in and say, hey, I don't want to take a 3D design class. I just want to do things on the computer you know, and start rendering and start using you know, 3D printers. Well, there's a time and place for all of those kind of things. You know, but using your hands always comes first. It, it shocked me because we had a cleanup in one of my um, sculpture studios. I had my student on a push broom. And to see them not understand how to use a push broom and they're sweeping all over their feet. <laughs> it's a push broom. It's the simplest technology on earth. But you don't know how to sweep with it. So it's that kind of thing that happens that, you know, and it can happen really quickly, especially for these younger generations that they forget the whole, the whole notion of what labor and, you know, you know, utilizing their hands and that type of thing. It's funny to me, but in you know, many ways it's really scary. Going behind the click. Yes. Um, I hope this uh, conversation to this point has stimulated some thoughts. And at this point, we'd be happy to uh, entertain some questions. Yes. Um, I'm curious about the beginning of your process, um, <coughs> about whether you make drawings and you photograph former um, factory sites, and whether you perhaps look at images of workers, like photographs that were taken at the time that they were working. So I'm curious about that. I have a second question. Um, having heard that you were big men, I expected um, human scale sized figures. And I'm curious if the reasons other than economy that um, you've chosen to work smaller. Well, just to hit upon that one, you can a second. Working backwards on your question. We do life size. Um, Lifestyle sculptures, definitely. We have a few in the works that's happening right now. Um, we did a life size on bronze sculpture from one college in Syracuse. Um, everyone has their particular thing. The reason that Kelly and I work the wall is now that we're in competition or equal competition with printmaking, photography, anything to 2D design that can hang on the wall. Most folks have more wall space than they do have floor space. So one of the things that we're really kind of drawn to is, is you know, just that having that sense of hanging things on the wall. That, that's our thing. Um, going back to the whole life size, sculpture in the round is beautiful, wonderful, but you have to think about the space around that sculpture is just as important as creating that piece as well. So a lot of people don't have that, that, that much of having space. So that is also the reason why that we work the wall and the scale that we work with. So the first question, I think that it's funny to speak about the last comment somebody asked. We were security guards, we were bodyguards, we were bouncers, so as if we're too big to do what we're doing. Um, I mean, we are, but I, I think that we make art, especially for the wall, because we relate it back to the whole notion of altars. Altars, that stations of the cross. Um, our work is very shrine-like. I don't know if that's the right word I want to use or not, but it's more very, very personal, very intimate. So we don't really get out into doing six, eight feet beyond you know, that, that kind of big work. I think going back to every artist, they have that, you know, their own thing, their own comfort zone, and that's where that's where we're at. Yeah. Uh, may I comment, um, sort of in an art critical way, to, to your question, Della? And I think that the art, if I were writing about it, this is monumentality. Even though the scale may be a figure this big, it's got a monumental feel built into it. If you look close or get a chance to go to the gallery, you should really look at the background facade first, and you'll start to see a, re, a reoccurring theme. Each one of those cells are actually skids or pallets that have been recladded over. So every factory, when you go outside and you see an abandoned factory, you'll see a big stack of skids, pallets, 
every one of our pieces start out in the same process. We'll start out with those found objects, that skid, and then we will reclap that skid with metal and other factory accoutrements that we ever find you know, around the site. So automatically that size is kind of um, rigid or structured. So, so our work does kind of remain the same size. So, but it's not to say that we can't work large. Money really encourages you to do big things when you have the big dollars kind of attached to it, such as the uh, Lomoy project. And Kyle and I are getting ready to do um, a project for the city of Cincinnati, um, a life-size piece. Um, so we do have the capabilities of working larger, but our, our, our thing, our niche, is really to kind of be alter working class stations of the cross size for the Thank you for your comments. Um, your pieces are very personal, but at another level, they evoke the blue collar experience, the decline of manufacturing in America, the plight of working class communities. Do you see your work as political? And to the extent that you do, what do you see as the contribution of art to broader political discourse about these issues in America? It's kind of funny to say that because some of the work that you see uh, up on the screen and work like that has actually been purchased by GM and Ford. So the very people that we're talking about are the very people that are buying the work, you know, like stick it to the man. But, <laughs> so it, it's, it, it is kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, it's the same scenario um, with Dorothea Lang's story about the WPA worker images kind of contrived or posed, and, you know, it's not so much that we're trying to make a quick buck because you know, we found our little niche and we'd love to do this. We love to do this first. And regardless of who buys the work, that's really not important. It's the message and the content that's in delivered through the work that, that really kind of informs and inspires, inspires us to, to do what we do. Um, it's not that I get mad at Chrysler for, for buying the work or you know they could buy it and you know, set it up back and torch it as soon as they buy it, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm more interested in that whole story because if that one piece gets bought and, you know, stored into a storeroom and no one sees it, guess what? We're going to keep making more. <laughs> so that's the way I look at it. And that's something that we learned early on from Diego Rivera. You know, Diego Rivera was very much interested in his, his you know, he had political views, obviously, but it didn't stop him from getting his messages out. And same thing for us. And, you know, whether it goes in someone's closet and no one sees it, you know, we're going to keep making more of it. But going back to the whole political notion, we do create work and we've caught criticism, especially using black imagery. You know, a lot of folks thought that we were desecrating, desecrating and destroying the flag. And you know, sometimes you have to do things to get your message across. It might not be pretty. You know, but I feel like we still have an obligation to speak truth. And it's not that we're being negative, but we're reflecting on, you know, what once was a great, you know, everyone had a sense of pride and belief in the factories and when, you know, factories fall down and, and the people fall with it. You know, what does that say about, you know, where we come from? That's where we're going. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Uh, you both are professors. Do you live near each other and how do you get together to work? How do you agree on that? Well, it all started out early on. Kyle got married first and screwed up my half the rent, so. <laughs> oh, wow, I gotta get married. I gotta do something. So um, he lives about six minutes about away. six minutes away from my house, and then at the end of our kind of our romantic notion of being a professor, I thought being a professor was gonna be real cool, and I'll make some art, and, you know, teach my cool class, and go home, but. No, by the time I get home, and by the time he's done with his classes, it's 11 o'clock. So we're typically working between 11 and 4 a.m. And a lot of our neighbors probably think that, you know, we have a meth lab or something going on. Because <laughs> oftentimes we're the only glowing light on the street. So it's, um, you work when you can, and you work because you love what you do, and it becomes. Art can drive you to the point where you forget to eat. Sometimes you forget that you have kind of external families like the wife, 
and your kid, and you lose all track of time. It's, it's really a love affair, and it's something that is deeply kind of rooted you know, within us. And it's, yeah, it's just a strong desire to keep, keep it going, and we've been doing this for, for years and years and years, and I don't see an end. And in fact, I mean, his wife would sometimes call me first wife because <laughs> our, our conversations are so in tune that, that, you know, he's the first person I talk to in the morning, last person I talk to at night. So it's like we are literally so in tune with each other and, and our art that it is who we are. And the art making what happens, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty special. It's pretty spiritual. I mean, you know, like I said, we're not religious people, but it's, as soon as we hit that studio, it becomes a very spiritual type of activity for us in between the cussing and cursing and yelling. But, <laughs> yes. um, just to go along with that, you said it was very interesting when you were talking about when we got our degree. You didn't say get our degrees, you said our degree. Did you go to the same undergraduate school? Same undergraduate, Did same. Did you work collaboratively? Then. Yes. Yes. And your teachers were totally okay with that? Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was always something that we had to prove. I mean, early on, I have to go backwards and think about you know the pre-programming, I should say, our parents really got us involved with early on. The fact that we, um, you guys will remember your high school or your childhood yearbooks, and you guys had your individual cell. Well, we didn't. I don't know if mom or dad were just cheap, but we had the same, we had two people in one cell, one photograph. So early on, we were programmed to kind of share and work together. So that, you know, went from high school to all the way through undergraduate, through undergraduate, to our graduate degrees. It was, we both had to do this together. In fact, in grad school, when we applied, we had to, I guess, not cheated. When we submitted our separate portfolios, they were so similar at the time as I go back to the notion of contaminating each other's work, they felt like one person submitted one body of work. So they asked us to resubmit. And we did it again. We submitted another body of work, but it was the same. It's, you know. it's always joining together, no single option. But I mean, to do this and to prove to you that it's not a given, I mean, we are separate professors with tenure at separate institutions. So. It is, it's, it's been a challenge to do this since day one, kindergarten to, to tenure, so it's been ongoing. Where did you get both of your degrees? First uh, undergraduate degree was from Ball State University. And the University of Kentucky for our MFA. MFA. I have a question about the figures. Um, they're so visually rich and they're embedded with such definite symbolism. I'm wondering how much preparation or research that you do uh, before you start to build the figures, um, and how you go about determining what you're putting in there as far as symbolism? Well, it always goes back to doing those interviews first. To, I guess, doing the interviews, doing the, the photography, the digital work, and then doing the, the sketches. But sometimes, even more than that, we start with just a block of clay. And, how would you describe it? Having kind of uh, deemed it as having X clay vision, so you can actually see that object in that clay. I know most painters can see what they're doing as soon as they get that first initial splash of paint on the canvas. But for, for Kyle and I, we actually um, have been doing this for such a long time. But you know, instead of 10 fingers on one lump of clay, you've got 20 fingers working on it. So there's a lot can happen when you have that active collaboration going on through that figurative work. But once again, it all starts out with those initial conversations through the interviews and you know documentation and a whole lot of sketching. Otherwise, you could sit there and try to block a play and see nothing. So you need that other, other bit of information that helps inform your work. I think one of the things that we, that we do, we hold true to as artists and passing it down to our students is the beauty of the sketchbook. You know, there are sketchbooks there are sketchbooks that I'm using, or that we are using, that are maybe 15, 20 years old. And the beauty about that is that you can always go back and revisit a sketch to generate ideas for something that you're working on in the future. Yes? Um, I really like this concept, uh, because I can relate to you guys like, on a lot of levels. 
Yeah, I grew up the same way. My dad was in labor for 30 years. Uh, went through all the same things. Uh, pretty much what you guys are describing right now when he comes home and takes his boots off. Um, um, what I want to do is, uh, you described um, when a plant shuts down and it pretty much almost takes down the town and how they wanted your father to reprogram or to move and you're like, he's been doing this for so long you just expect him to learn this technology when kids are coming out of high school. Um, I was wondering if, if you haven't already, if you plan on uh, ever doing any, any pieces that display the horrors of a layoff uh, because after 30 years at that plant, my dad has been laid off. It's been a year and he still can't find a job because he, they just, you know, there you go. And now, like, I, I used to always see like this really hardworking man that I aspire to be, and I still do because he's a great dad and worked hard. But I still don't see the same guy because he's broken. And I was wondering if, if you haven't already made those pieces, if uh, that's something you might have. That, that, that is our work. I, mean, that's, I know exactly what you're talking about. We do have several pieces. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where they're at slide wise, but. You'll, you'll see one, it will be familiar. We did a piece called News of the Layoff um, early on, and it wasn't, once again, this hero site. It was about the moment that the factory worker was laid off. But it was typical, it's kind of jive to think that a factory will work you until you're into your shift before you got your pink slip. The end, when it's time for you to clock out, that's when you got your pink slip. So they still squeeze out one full eight-hour shift, and then got rid of you at the end of the shift. Kelly and I can remember the very day that Kelly and I received our pink slip. And what they did was everyone that didn't have 14 years and plus, seniority, they got to stay. Everybody else that didn't, well, they had the opportunity to basically go to Ivy Tech or float with the, the factory that might be going to Canada or going to, to Mexico. Well, who at a middle age is going to pack up and, and travel? Who's going to do that? So you're kind of lived in limbo land, and, and you, you don't know what to do, or you can't find jobs that pay, you know, what your income used to be while working in a factory at the time. So it's really disheartening. It's really sad, and it's just it's it's everywhere, unfortunately. But it's that moment. It's those those images at that moment where people actually got their pink slip, or they got that notification. Those are those images that come to mind that really relate back to our work. It's that moment of just receiving that. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Every morning, and like, he would still go down, you know, get up and hit his work clothes on, go nowhere, but literally hit those same work clothes on and, and just wait. But he was pre programmed, and when you do something that long, you're part of that machine. You, you're programmed, you're, you're still that worker. You would think dad would go out uh, and swim the golf club or go fishing, and the dad felt like he had to go and do something. You know, he's still in that kind of work mode. All the way until we died. My father had um, uh, a disability, a dis what do you call that? Yeah, mesothelioma from being exposed to uh, asbestos from Firestone. But he also had, um, he was exposed to cutting oils that were also, the cutting oils were, had a carcinogen in it, so he developed cancer. And, yeah. But all of that relates right back to those injuries that came from you know, the factory. And, and then you're, you become disposable. You become this disposable, cast-off thing. 
a lot of our work doesn't show those type of injuries, but a lot of our work will show kind of the broken brokenness that you can see with, with factory workers. Uh, from being kind of, you know, factories tend to use the lifeblood out of you until you are no longer valued and then replaced by a machine. A good example, my father, once he re was forced to retire, the very machines that he serviced, the very machines that he worked on during his one shift, replaced, were replaced by machines that they acquired from Korea. One machine wiped out three shifts because he could run 23 hours a day with one hour seven. So three grown men shifts gone because of the technology. Now, I'm not saying technology is good or bad, I'm just saying that's the way of the world it is today. I don't know how unusual it is for identical twins to have the same artistic background. I, I don't recall hearing that before. And are there any other artists in the family? Um, I think all factory workers are artists. I think they're all craftsmen. Um, I think, um, and I, I really do believe this. I mean, we we um, we come from a very rich background where art isn't just for the elite. Art is for everyone. And a lot of the factory workers, you know, were welders, or they were gear cutters. They were, you know, they worked on lathes, and they all had really very unique, creative um, you know, skills. They were craftsmen. Every one of them had something very unique that they could offer society. But we look at them only as factory workers. We look at them only as you know, laborers. But well, we don't look at them well, we don't at, them at all. We just look at the end product, a new minivan that runs off the assembly line, or a new Maytag washing machine. You know, but we don't look at the individual and what they can contribute. Uh, my father was, you know, he was a handyman. He, he would model homes and, and he'd be amazed what he, what he was capable of doing with his hands. And I think every factory worker has that type of ability to, to do that. I'd like to address that question. And uh, Kelly and Kyle are too modest to say it themselves, but I think it is a rarity to see twins working in this way of a unified artistic consciousness. It happens very rarely in the professional world. I know of one set of twins who um, are photographers who, who work like this, but yes, it's quite unusual. Programmed early on for our parents to, to share, and, and you know, like an example, we had one set of books the entire, our entire educational life. We shared one set of books. So having to share and understand that you know, we started to develop the same likes, the same taste. It's it's just who we are, and we're, we're constantly trying to defend that to everybody. That you know, it's not just Kyle and I'm the kind of the carrier. It's it's Kelly and Kyle. We both strongly believe and feel and do what we do. I want to thank Kelly and Kyle Phelps and uh, the audience for participating and thank you so much for coming.